Welcome to Coming from Left Field, where we have conversations about politics, books, and current events with your host, Greg Gottles and Pat Cummings. I will admit that I tend to run with the liberal herd, which I'm sure exacerbates my political polarization. Some of my oldest and dearest friends acquire their worldview from Fox, Newsmax, Breitbart, Prager University, and similar sources. Certain themes appear over and over in our political engagement. Schools are Marxist indoctrination factories. Regulations are destroying jobs. Taxes are theft. Climate change is exaggerated. There is a war on Christians, and I could go on and on. How do you respond to people you love who have been so effectively influenced by these conservative memes. Our guest today has some thoughts on how one might respond to the right. Warm greetings. Glad to have you on our podcast, Nathan. Hey, nice to be with you. I I have to explain something to you first, though. Um, I put this flower shirt on, and my wife said, you're wearing that? That's ridiculous. That is the stupidest thing. Don't wear that. She didn't like the flower shirt? And then it just so happens that Greg's wife gave him the identical flower shirt. And so he put it on. So we're the, uh, we're the you, host. Like, you look fan. great. You yeah, both look fantastic. We're the, I we're have the, to say. We're the, we're the flower shirt bros. And I, my wife, I my just wife, feel left out if I had been told there was a dress code. I, well, uh, there you go. So. Listen, I'm excited to have you on, Nathan, and I, I need to give you a, a little background. You are um, uh, one of the fellows I've been following for years and years with your uh, Current Affairs uh, magazine. Current I've, Affairs. I've yeah. given this out to many people. Uh, I highly recommend uh, Current Affairs magazine. You started this, uh, what, 2015 or so? Yeah, that's right. That's right. And just started as a kickstart. It is a wonderful, wonderful magazine. The artwork and the layout and mm. uh, the content is just uh, can't say can't say much enough about it. And I'll link to yes. your magazine. Uh, if you get the magazine, I think you get a you get a free copy of the book that we're talking about. Is that correct? Well, you did. Unfortunately, we've edited that out. We ran out of books, so we <laughs> had a lot of people subscribe, but they got the they got the books. But uh, now we don't have any more books. Okay. Well, there you go. So we'll have to uh, buy the book. We're talking about this book, uh, Responding to the Right, and that's your latest book. The one before that is Why I'm a Socialist, and you've written, I don't know, eight, nine, ten books. You're, a you're, few. Yeah, there's a few out now. A few books. Uh, and uh, you are also a... Um, your 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 uh, mentor or the person that uh, means an awful lot to you is Noam Chomsky, correct? Yeah, that's right. That's right. And he and I are working on a book together now. You are working on a book with Noam Chomsky. Yeah, yeah, we're we're writing a book on American foreign policy. Oh my God! Well, Greg is not a huge Noam Chomsky fan, which is one of our great points of disagreement. But I, Greg, I want you. You haven't read this, but this is what Noam Chomsky said about Nathan. Nathan Robinson's articles in Current Affairs generally have been consistently challenging and thought-provoking with uh, incisive critique and informative discussion, lucid, provocative, and focused on well-chosen issues of major significance. I find myself regularly recommending Robinson's articles to others and rereading them myself, usually valuable contributions. So there you go, Greg. That's... uh, you're with you're in the company of two people that are Noam Chomsky fans, and and just for your purpose, uh, 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 Nathan, this oh, is there my, we go. yeah my uh, customized license plate in my electric car is a uh, Chomsky. That's um, fantastic! I so love there, it. There I go. love it. Amazing. <laughs> so, I'll watch out for that. What state are you in? I'm in Washington State. Okay, so, so if I'm ever in Washington, I'll, I'll watch and, for the and Chomsky And Greg's in Phil. Uh, uh, Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. Pen- Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Cool, cool. Tell, tell us about your book, Nathan. I like this. I liked it a lot. Tell us oh, about thanks. it. Thanks. Responding to the right. Yeah. Brief replies to 25 conservative arguments. Well, I um, there's actually all these... Ki- this kind of book exists on the right. There's a bunch of books called, like, Responses to 50 Liberal Arguments or Demolishing Liberal Lies and all, all this sort of stuff. 
And interestingly, I, I always wanted kind of a, you know, I'm a, I'm a man of the left and I wanted a kind of equivalent to this because I think there's a reason that people on the right publish these kinds of books, which is that they give ammunition to everyday people who are going to go out and are going to want to defend their politics. And they sort of explain, well, here's here's what the arguments are. Uh, when you get into arguments with people, here's what you can say. And um, and I realized that this kind of book didn't exist on the left. And I thought, well, we really need to have something like this because people, I, I actually think people on the left can be weaker than they think in coming up with effective responses in conversation. Conservatives are very good at snappy lines and they got talking points and they got it all laid out. And, um, and I'm kind of amazed by how well they do at pushing their talking points. So I wanted a book that would just go through and first it would explain how conservative arguments kind of work, what the kind of common tendencies are, what you what you'll be used to hearing. And then, as it says, how you can respond to them. And then I go through and I give 25 different very common talking points from like taxes or theft to abortion is murder to um, the anti uh anti-critical race theory stuff to uh, all, all sorts of stuff to socialized medicine will kill your grandma. And I go through and I explain what the left's position is and why I think the right wing argument doesn't make sense. And I quote from the right wing arguments. Um, so that's uh, the book's pretty simple. And that's what it is. Right. Right. And I noticed that, um, you know, when I talk to my friends, we're, Greg and I are both from the Midwest. He's on the East Coast. Now I'm on the West Coast. And many of my dear friends still remain in the the midwest and some of them consume a steady diet of conservative media and these uh these uh, arguments that uh you refute are the arguments that our conversations consist of right you know, i i don't want my kids indoctrinated into becoming you know trans in public schools what's wrong with that you know yeah. uh, or or what wh whatever you know they they yeah. that's an exaggeration but uh the idea that government you know, the classic one government is just not an effective way of helping people it, it's yeah. uh, I, the less I, government uh, the better i i probably spend a little more time than you do in the midwest because my sister's there and i gotta go back but i, I find it more helpful to uh to find a point of agreement uh, mm -hmm. rather than to, to take on arguments because usually arguments are either from Fox News or MSNBC uh, and that just throws a big smoke screen up for any kind of conversation. I think you can relate to people, many of whom vote for Trump. I know in the neighborhood where my sister lives, there's a lot of Trump signs more than I'd like to yeah. see. But when you talk to people, there's plenty of points of agreement and there's the deindustrialization of the Midwest mm -hmm. It's glaring, and and few on the the broad left, the Democrats, uh, if you include the Democrats, even the Democratic Socialist left, really engage that that deindustrialization, what it yeah. means in terms of drug addiction, deaths, suicides, and so on. I remember I was at a strike. This is over ten years ago, but uh, a, a factory in the area where I where my 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 cousin lives, and he was on the picket line, so I joined him and. This guy rides up in his Harley and they're chatting. And I, I didn't know him. He went to high school, different high school than I did. About a month later, he killed himself. You know, this is a reality in the Midwest mm -hmm. that a lot of liberals, a lot of Eastern, certainly uh, urbans, uh, don't understand. and They don't uh, engage. So I, I'm all for the arguments. I mean, the arguments have their place. They have them in, in engagements and, you know, on, on TV and radio. But when you actually talk to real people, I think you're going to yeah. find that they don't really repeat so much the the uh, fox news arguments as they they have their own concerns they yeah. have their own worldview uh, my 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 sister is buoyed up by the church she goes to well i'm an atheist i don't believe in the god i think it's silly but i don't i don't argue with them i have plenty to talk to them about in terms of conditions in the neighborhood mm -hmm. and school system and so on and i think that's the way the left can begin to enlarge and erode some of the support for the uh, yeah. the Trump right. Yeah, no, I I agree with everything everything you said there. I mean, I'm a great admirer of Bernie Sanders because I think he does this very very effectively. I mean, Bernie would uh, go out to 
uh, Trump supporting places and he would just ask people what well, I mean he would say you know tell me about your life tell me about your problems tell me about the sort of things that you're facing well you know here's why the Republican Party isn't going to solve these things here's the here's the things that I propose to do that are going to address these things um I, I consider the kind of two books that I've put out to kind of go together and not really work the, the, the one doesn't work apart from the other right so this is kind of the negative case and the other was the positive case so the first one i did was the kind of positive case and it said a lot of this kind of stuff you know here's how here are the various problems facing people here's how you listen empathetically current affair current affairs we have never been I, i've always really disliked the political approach on the left that is contemptuous of or you know this was captured in of course hillary clinton's infamous basket of deplorables comment i really really don't like that i think it's a political dead end i think people are human beings you got to treat them as human beings you got to listen to them um and there so there are different circumstances there are circumstances where i think you've got to do what what you're talking about there and I, even at the end of this book i say that actually arguments are only part of it a big part of it is relationships so getting people to trust you getting people to like you getting people to think that or to understand that you care about that them and their lives and what happens to them um but there are circumstances when you are going to need to defend a position that you hold and, and you think is really important and someone else really strongly disagrees with because they've heard a bunch of nonsense and i think in in those particular circumstances that's what that's what this particular book that i've, I've written is is meant for yeah it, it, don't assume other people are stupid is one of right that's one of them know, and that's yeah, one of the things i said and familiarize yourself with their arguments and um uh stories are as important you know as empirical correctness it, it where, where are the where are the trains derailed that that went for mm -hmm. obama and then it and it's now 30 points for trump how how do you have a swing like that in just a handful of years in that part of the country that, that that's that's an that's an important phenomenon and yeah. um okay uh, the other thing i like about your book in the introduction is exactly what you just said is trying to treat people with respect uh ask questions try to restate their arguments don't give up on people and um mm -hmm. that's that's a you know that that's certainly the point of your book is is strongly emphasizing those points yeah it's interesting because my book in one sense can look like ah oh, here's it can look a little self-righteous in a certain way. Like here's all the here's all the ways that you as a leftist can shut down all these terrible ideas and make them look foolish. Um, but in fact, I consider there to be a certain level of respect in the fact that it is producing serious responses to these arguments, that it's taking them seriously, right? Because I think there is a terrible instinct that kind of uh, speaks to again what Greg was was talking about. That it, that is like. I'm not even going to talk to those people. I'm not going to engage with them. They are beneath my discussion. I don't have to, you know, they they can't be persuaded. They're beyond reason. They're just a bunch of fascists and racists. And and how can you how can you even have an argument or, or a serious conversation with them? And I just reject that entirely. I think that you can't give up on people. You have to, you know, you have to think, well, how how am I going to convince this person that if, if I think that I, if I want them to stop voting Republican, <laughs> if I want them to pull things over to my side, you know, how am I going to persuade them? How am I going to listen to what they have to say and, um, and come up with something that's going to be compelling to them? Well, I think there's a lot of frustration, you know, uh, with, and this, this is what the rights tapped into and you have to kind of be sensitive to that. Um, when you try to approach people, um, the, the reality is that most people, most people, whatever they're, however they voted, feel as though no one cares. No one really pays attention to what they want or what they need. Uh, great examples of that. I mean, for example, single payer or, or Medicare for all, every opinion poll shows 70 to 80% of the people in this country support it. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter how you phrase it. It used to be you had to phrase it just a certain way for people mm -hmm. to understand what you meant. Now everybody knows. And yet there's not a ghost of a chance of us getting that through our political system today. Bernie Sanders, who's our 
our best hope for that, started off his tenure in the Senate and his new committee and said, that's not going to be on the table. Mm -hmm. So this disconnect between the politicians, I think, Democratic mm -hmm. and Republican politicians, you know, they both play it. They play that disconnect their own way. That's the real problem in this country. I mean, that's the real problem that we need to address. We need to find a way to get um, to shake them loose and, mm -hmm. and pay attention to what people want. That's, I think, the, 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 that's the back, the back story to what Pat mentioned about the group in Ohio supporting Obama twice and then voting for Trump by, by big numbers. They want somebody to give them some answers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So changing the subject slightly, uh, you've been talking a little bit about woke. Uh, you, um, I don't know if you saw Freddie, Freddie DeBoer's uh, Substack, but you came up again in that. You're having a little bit of a dialogue back and forth with him and others on how you define woke. Yeah, and and you wrote a, a very interesting article of how we um, I think the the uh, woke as a pejorative. Yeah. Um, I I re I follow conservative uh, cable TV. I've read Mark Levin. Yeah. I I I mean I try I try to see what the other yeah, yeah. other people are saying and. You know, you look at this horrible shooting in Tennessee and mm. the primary emphasis on Tucker and Hannity is this is just a a, a problem of people overemphasizing mm. trans wokeness and this is what you get. Yeah. And I, I, it's I don't know. Give, give me your give me your thoughts of what you think the term woke has come to mean and what it should mean. Well, I. I... I don't like the term very much because I think that, in fact, after there was this incident that I wrote in response to where my colleague at Current Affairs, who is a host on Rising on the Hill, asked a, a kind of anti-woke author if she could define the term, and uh, she couldn't come up with a definition, even though she'd just written a book about it, and it sort of went viral. And uh, so then there was this kind of flurry of articles about what does it mean? And there are a lot of people on the right say, well, I know exactly what it means. It means this, this, and this. Um, and Freddie wrote a thing, as you say, that he says, oh, well, of course, it's, it's got a very specific meaning. Um, but one of the things I pointed out in the article that I wrote is that those all those people who say it has a very specific meaning, their, their definitions all kind of contradict each other. Um, and so for some people, it means like, I mean, any uh, anything that suggests that uh, we should have basic equality for transgender people would be would be wokeness. Uh, Freddie defines it as a kind of symbolic politics that tries to fix the world through language instead of redistributing resources. Those kind of things are sort of kind of different. And I think that what has happened is that a lot of people who dislike either all of the left or some tendencies on the left have begun to use the term as the catch-all for whatever the things that they don't like on the left are. And I don't like certain things on the left. I share a lot of the criticisms of silly things that are on the left, um, but I don't think the term is very analytically helpful. And also, I, I did an interview recently with a, um, uh, a black blues musician, Samuel James from Maine, who you know specializes in the history of black music and the, and we talked about the origins of woke in the song uh by uh, lead belly uh, from the 1940s about the scottsboro boys and where he's talking about you know when black people uh, go to alabama they need to stay woke uh, meaning they need to you know keep their eyes open for racists who might kill them and i think given that that's the the origin of the term given that it's a black term that means like watch out for racism I think it's kind of a shame to have it turn into this pejorative and this subject of mockery. I think that it also gets in the way of having an adult conversation about, well, okay, instead of just condemning this nebulous, amorphous thing called wokeness, where some on the conservative right think it means every, every, everything pro-gay or anti-racist, and some on the left who use the term think it means, okay, these particular kinds of, of problems like cancel culture or whatever. Um, I, I think let's just ditch the term and let's try and talk more precisely 
about the things that we object to and why we object to them. So the argument that I've made is that I don't think the use of that term in a pejorative manner is illuminating. <laughs> Right. I, I have to agree hundred percent. I think it should be retired and it's been uh, weaponized. I think that's essentially what you're saying. And to the point where whatever whatever historical uh, meaning you can extract from it, it's kind of it's irrelevant now because it's mm -hmm. so weaponized. So many terms like that, uh, neoliberalism one is on a theoretical level. It doesn't have any any grounding anymore because people use it. <laughs> we banned it from the magazine. <laughs> oh, you did Good. ban neoliberalism? No, I mean, not no, entirely. People can use it occasionally, but I really hate it. I try and cut it. Good for you. Good for you. <laughs> That's one of our comments. Yeah, one person's. I, I'm liking your magazine more and more when I hear that. <laughs> that makes you feel really. Uh, what, one per I, I liked your 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 thoughts. One person's angry mob is another person's popular protest, and you need to define. You know, you need yeah. to define your terms and and so forth. Um, your your book before i've i've only got through a couple of chapters of it i usually read everything before i have gone but i've i've listened to a bunch of your uh, several of your youtubes of why you are or why you're a socialist yeah, yeah. and uh, i liked uh, the uh, beginning of the book how you talked about at one point in time there was an awful lot of socialism in the united states eugene debs uh we have talked about the Midwest and the uh, farmers yeah. co-ops and uh, um, why are you a socialist? Well, you know, the, the, there is an argument to be had over whether it's a useful term or too much of a misleading term. But um, I sort of am a socialist because when I think about well, what are my core political convictions? What are my values? What do I care about? What, how, what changes do I want to see in the world? The, the kind of tradition in which I locate myself in terms of when you look back over the history of people who have advocated for various things, the people who are most on board with the things that I now believe are people who have called themselves socialists. They are people like Eugene Debs. They are people like, well, Martin Luther King. They are people like Albert Einstein and Helen Keller and, uh, and of course, Bernie Sanders. And they have sort of defined being a socialist as usually the core of it is an opposition to class inequality, the idea of a small number of, a small concentrated number of people who own a massively disproportionate amount of the wealth and a much larger number of people who have to work for a living and, and sell their labor to the, that other small number of people. And so they've always been horrified. Socialists have always been horrified by poverty. They've always, they've almost always been anti-war. The anti-war movement in America is very closely linked to, of course, that's what sent Eugene Debs to jail. Right. Um, and, um, and of course, Martin Luther King famously opposed to the Vietnam War. So when I look back over, over uh, the course of the history of politics, I have always identified with the socialists, uh, not all the socialists, right? There's the authoritarian socialists versus the democratic socialists. But I think the democratic socialists have tended to be right on things. And when I look at the democratic socialists of our own time, uh, Bernie Sanders, to me, is the person I agree with the most. And so the label that he has embraced for his politics is the one I kind of embrace for mine. And I am I think my politics are very aligned with yours. Um, Greg takes it up a notch. He's, he's written a lot for Marxist-Leninists and uh, uh, publications. And I've never asked Greg this before, but Greg, why are you a communist? I just asked Nathan why he's a socialist. Why are you a communist? Well, the term socialist is interesting because it was uh, really forbidden, whether it's communist, socialist, whatever, in after the McCarthy during and after the McCarthy era, didn't come back into uh, any kind of common usage in this country until relatively recently. And so, in that era, in that era, uh, a lot of what uh, what Nathan referred to as is 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 things he strongly believes in were identified with liberalism, liberalism in the fifties and sixties, uh, because that became the broad term for progressive ideas. But today you're allowed to be a socialist, and I welcome that. I mean, I welcome the fact that 
the word is back in currency. You're not you're not put in jail for saying you're a socialist. You're not condemned widely. Uh, eyes don't always uh, go glassy when you say uh, you're a socialist. So that's a happy thing. But in the 20th century, after 1919, 1918, 1919, the only real advocates for socialism have been communists. And the communists have been the carrier of the Marxist tradition and the tradition that believe that not only should you be appalled by inequities, but there ought to be a social organization, a way of organizing society in which those things would be done away with. They would be they would be removed. And that goes back to the Communist Manifesto. So I'm very happy to be in that tradition, locate myself in that tradition. It's a very small tradition now. And, and in the 1970s, in fact, the communist movement in general was, uh, was huge in the world, not just China, the Soviet Union, but all through Africa, all the emerging countries, uh, not all, but many uh, adhered to Marxism-Leninism. It was a shallow Marxism-Leninism, unfortunately, but it was that, and that's all been turned back. So I recognize it's not a popular view today, but it's one I think that upholds a tradition that is the only true and authentic um, belief in socialism and, and a, a social system that is socialist um, in our time. Uh, Nathan, I want to thank you for one thing. Um, when I was working, I would often um, stream lectures and YouTube things, and I was a big fan of Jordan Peterson. I literally uh, listened to almost every one of his college lectures. Uh, and he's actually a pretty good psychologist when it comes to personality and intelligence and so forth. And I read his book uh, and thought, well, this kind of makes sense. And then I read your critique, <laughs> your critique of him. And I think that goes to your book, Responding to the Right. It is possible for people to lay out reasonable, structured, intelligent uh, observations uh, that change people's mind, mm -hmm. and and you changed my you changed my mind, and now of course I'll I'll take some of the things he says with a grain of salt, but uh, primarily it's a, it's amazing how I was uh, duped by his early academic prowess to uh, get uh, manipulated by his um, politics, which aren't very aren't very good. So I want to no. thank you. And they <laughs> seem to get worse too. He's now. Uh... <laughs> He now talks about climate change a lot, and he really doesn't know what he's talking about. Uh, <laughs> well, what makes him a big deal, uh, Nathan? What makes him a big deal? I, I, I don't. I don't what know. makes uh, yes, yeah. what makes him a big deal? Well, I I feel like I feel like Pat, as the former Jordan Peterson fan, would be in a better position to answer that than me. But um, I mean, he is quite a charismatic uh, speaker. You know, he he came. There was a lot of news about him because he had very prominently. He was a professor at the University of Toronto when he opposed this bill, this gender equity bill that was was being passed. And he got a lot of media attention then, and he kind of used the media attention to become a major public figure, offering a lot of advice to lost, particularly lost young men. And he wrote this book, 12 Rules for Life, that was kind of this self-help thing and, you know, built a big following because he is quite charismatic and... Um, and and the idea was that he was the uh, he he was a guru figure for right. for mostly men right. who are looking for meaning and and purpose in in their life. I, I don't know, if Pat, you want to add anything to that? I exactly. And he, you know, when I had friends send me information about you know this lobster stuff and this hierarchy <laughs> is just not scientific, and this isn't. Uh, and then Chomsky gave you. <laughs> gave you a big shout out of how he yeah. has has frequently sent people uh, yeah, he your sends article on uh, your article on Peterson. Yeah. When people ask about Peterson, he just sends the link. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought I thought anyway, and I guess that's part of being a dialectical thinker is just changing your opinion, changing, sure. you know, changing how you see things, revisiting how you see people. Uh, and I and I is when before you got on, Greg and I were chatting about how there are so many people that we like parts of what they say, but not others. You yeah. know, Joe Joe Rogan. Uh, yeah, yeah, done, he's real. Yeah, he's, he's done some remarkable 
uh, effective takedowns of climate change with Candace. Well, yeah, you see in the book, he's John Rogan's in the book is an example of how to have conversations with people. (laughs) Yeah. And, you know, but he, he recently got in a hissy fit with Sam, uh, cedar about uh, the marginal tax rate and tax rate has nothing to do with our present economic woes which is you know i think a little bit um a little a little bit silly so I, even even tucker carlson i mean at times tucker carlson was the it's only true. person that had people it's on <laughs> to get a different point of view and yet i think by and large his politics that's I, right i disagree with it and i think that's again going back to the Going back to the point of your book of you know respecting other people's arguments, trying to right. figure out where they're coming from. Uh, well, we have to give up the team metaphor. We can't just have a team. I mean, you can't just be on this person's team or that person's team. You got to be a little more critical. I think by by your your book on arguments, you're helping people do that. They're sticking with issues rather than than personalities. What what's your yeah. uh, your, your new book on uh, foreign policy, where is that going to take things? Can you give us a preview? Can we sneak sure, preview? Oh, sure, yeah. So um, it's uh, tentatively called, and we're looking for a snappier title, uh, the, the Myth of American Idealism, How U.S. Foreign Policy Endangers the World. And mm-hmm. uh, it is basically, you know, anyone who's picked up one of Noam Chomsky's books knows that he has very powerful criticisms of United States foreign policy, they're not always the most accessible. So this is my attempt to work with him to produce a digestible for the public uh, kind of introduction to his critique of American foreign policy. And the, the way it's framed is that the United States views itself as an idealistic nation that, you know, may sometimes make mistakes, but doesn't act out of raw self-interest in the way that other empires do. And the point that Chomsky has always made is that actually uh, everyone, uh, all ruling powers throughout history have viewed themselves as idealistic. They all think that they act out of benevolent motives when they're in fact adding, acting out of selfish motives. Um, and the critique is that the United States does not make mistakes. In fact, oftentimes the things that are characterized as uh, terrible mistakes are quite deliberate. Um, and so he, we run through um, basically the last century of mil- the use of military force by the American government and show the origins, motives, consequences of that use of force. And the purpose, the whole purpose of it is in the subtitle, which is how U.S. foreign policy endangers the world. And so the point is that until uh, America starts to recognize how its actions can in fact make the world a much more dangerous place like by when we undermine international law by claiming the right to invade other countries like iraq um, it emboldens others like vladimir putin to do the same thing um and you know and u.s climate policy and uh the nuclear arms race and the sort of u.s opposition to reasonable arms control measures are now you know, in his view, and I, I, I share it, it's sort of threatening the future of human safety. Um, so this is that's kind of the core argument that we make over the course of the book. Oh, I can hardly wait to read that. Yeah, I'll have to, um, I'll, I'll, I'll have to have Chomsky on to discuss it. I sent him an invitation, and he didn't get back to me. So I'm, he's kind of on my, my, you know, no Christmas card list. So I'll <laughs> see if I can. In, in fairness, he is ex- he's extreme. I don't know how he does all of the things that he actually does, but uh, he uh, is really. I I can't even. You know, it takes him weeks to respond to me because he's got such. He's drowning in such a pile of email. Yeah, I I audited his course a year ago, and it was just remarkable. I mean, he just he's yeah, so ninety three year old. You know, uh, he's inspiring. Ninety four yeah. actually. So well, I'll I'll let you go, Nathan. I know you're busy writing, and and you're a New Orleans uh New Orleans bro, correct? Beautiful New Orleans, Louisiana. Yeah. Have you been to Giacomo's restaurant before? No, I haven't been to Giacomo's restaurant. You know, I'm a vegetarian, so I have a hard time actually eating at the famous restaurants in New Orleans. Yeah, I'm a vegetarian too. But uh, anyway, that's uh, yeah. We, well, we... I'm not, so I'll eat. Yeah, you. well, you guys should come down here, and uh, we'll take you. I'll take you out to someplace good. It's one of my favorite. One of my favorite.
favorite towns. I've been to Jazz Fest three or four times and plan to go well, again. And if you find yourself back here, come by Current Affairs headquarters. And, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll see stop, the office. I'll, say hello. You're both welcome to stop I'll, by. Say I'll, hi. I'll, I'll I'll stop in. Do you like Do you like hot sauce? Uh, I can't say that I do like hot sauce. I, I don't know if I've had much hot sauce in my life, but I don't slather hot sauce on things. Uh, okay. All right. Okay. Well, I was going to send you some hot sauce for my son, but, but uh, <laughs> okay. I'll, I'll, I'll save it for someone else. So. Yeah. I'm really out of step with the local food culture. <laughs> Nathan, thank you so much for spending hey, time. Hey, this has been I, fun. I really you're... nice to meet you both. Thank I know you. you're. I know you're busy. I'm going to link to your book. I just want people to start to follow your magazine yeah. and uh, follow your work. You're yeah, a prolific, we, uh, prolific you know, fellow, and a lot to say. We're completely we, we independent. Neoliberalism right? out. Yeah, yeah. We, if you want a magazine that will not feature the word neoliberalism, we are a completely right, independent right. magazine. We're only reader funded, and no ads, no corporate backers. You know, no, you know, private equity owners. So we depend on our readers. So people should subscribe. That's true. All right. Thanks again. All right. Bye. I'll see you both. Bye. Bye. Bye.